Well, let's take a look at section 16.3, which is going to be the fundamental theorem of line integrals. So we're going to be adapting the fundamental theorem of calculus. We probably looked that back in Calc 1 and try and apply it to line integrals, which we looked at in the last section. So our learning objectives. Uh, determine if a vector field is conservative. And if it is, in fact, a conservative vector field, we'll find its potential function. Uh, and we'll also want to be able to use the fundamental theorem of line integrals, which to call back to Calc 1, the fundamental theorem of calculus is the one that says that the integral from a to b of some function little f uh, is equal to f of b minus f of a, where that's, you know, capital F and capital, or yeah, capital F for the integrated function. So a definite integral should just be equal to the difference between two points on the function that we integrate into. So that was the fundamental theorem from Calc 1. We're going to apply it to line integrals. Uh, but first, we need to go over several definitions. So first, a region D is open if every point P within that region D, uh, there is some disk at with its center at P and that disk lies entirely in D. Uh, in other words, D does not contain any of its boundary points. So a couple sections ago, we looked at closed sets because we needed closed sets when we were looking at uh, extreme values. This time we're gonna wanna look strictly at open sets. Uh, and so again, if it's open, that means that it does not contain any of its boundary. Uh, so its boundary must be totally open. Uh, that makes it an open set. Uh, then we'll define a connected region. So our region D is connected if any two points in D can be joined by a path that lies entirely in D. So that basically means whatever, whatever this region is, it's just one blob. It's not gonna be two separate blobs that's got space in the middle, or there's no extra points that lie outside of our one main blob. It's just one connected region. Uh, next, we're gonna call a curve closed if its terminal point equals its end point, or its terminal point equals its initial point. Uh, so you know, basically think like that's a loop or some kind of, some kind of a circle-like object. Uh, and if it's just some line, then it's not gonna be closed. Uh, next, a curve is simple if it does not intersect itself except at its endpoints, so no crossing allowed. Uh, and finally, a region D is simply connected if it is connected and every simple closed curve encloses points only in D. Uh, so that last part means that a shape like a donut uh, would not be simply connected because even though it is one, one continuous blob, one connected shape, uh, we could find a closed region that would enclose points that are not in D since we'd have points that are you know, in the donut hole. So let's look at a few examples just of what is closed, not closed, simply connected, all that kind of fun stuff. As we can see in figure six, uh, there are uh, a few examples of types of curves. In the lower left, we have a simple closed curve, which is just a loop with no crossing or anything fancy like that. Uh, and then we go through an example where we look at, you know, being not simple or not closed or not simple and not closed. And figure seven shows a few regions. Uh, the top is just a simply connected region. Uh, and then the bottom three are all examples that are not simply connected for one reason or another. So that those first two uh, look like the example of the donut that I gave a moment ago where they are connected, but I could create some closed path, say like this one, uh, that will enclose points that are not in D since we've got that hole in the middle. Let's actually have it go nice and connected. Same with the shape in the middle. Uh, again, there, there are gaps within our connected region so that I could find some closed curve that will enclose points that are not in the region. And then finally, that third one 
uh, that one is not simply connected because it's, well, it's not connected. Uh, even though I could create all, in fact, all closed curves that are in that third shape uh, will in fact uh, contain or enclose only points that are in D since a closed curve would not be allowed uh, to pass over that gap. Uh, but the gap, you know, of course means that it's not connected. So it definitely can't be simply connected. So we're talking about a simply connected region, hopefully something like the shape or the region on top is what comes to mind. Uh, but let's check out some examples. So we're going to evaluate the line integral of F on a curve C. We go from the point 0, 0 to 1, 1 uh, in the vector field given by F, which is 2x and 2y. Uh, where C is a curve parameterized by three different options. So if we start with that first option, uh, recall uh, that if from the last section, the line integral uh, over some field uh, should be equal to that field with our parameterization plugged in multiplied by the derivative vector of that parameterization. So we'll still go from zero to one. Oh, what was that shape? Ha, still had ink to shape turned on. Zero to one of, we'll have two t, two t, since both x and y are t, dotted with its derivative vector, and this is the derivative of the parameterization. So it's the derivative of TT, which would be one, one, all multiplied by DT, uh, which if we clean that up a little bit, the integral from zero to one of two T plus two T DT or four T, uh, so this thing should be 4t squared. Oop, let's try that again. 4t squared over 2, which is 2t squared, evaluated from 0 to 1, uh, which will just come out to 2. And then let's also take a look at that second example. So I'll pull my ruler up here. Uh, so this one at least was that first example. Uh, and then over here to the right, I guess I'll do it in blue. Be the second example. Uh, and we're going to take the integral from zero to one. Uh, what do we get when we plug in the second parameterization? We still have 2t for the x component, but for the y component, we'll have 2t squared. And for the derivative vector of the parameterization, we'll get 1 for the x component and 2t for the y component. If we clean up that integral a little bit, uh, this should be the integral of 2t plus 4t cubed. If we take that dot product and dt, uh, and evaluate that integral, we should have t squared plus t to the fourth from zero to one, uh, which should again come out to two. And hopefully we're starting to see that a pattern might be emerging here. I'll leave the third example as an exercise, but I bet if you, you know, do all the math correct, you should find ultimately that the answer you get is two. Uh, and that's because 
the particular integral that we're looking at, or the particular line integral we're looking at here is path independent. So let's talk about what that means. Uh, so definition, assume that F is a vector field defined on an open region D if any two points, A and B being those points, in the region D and any curve C goes from A to B. Uh, then, and if the line integral is the same for any curve that connects A and B, we say that the integral is path independent. So rephrasing what that thing meant, uh, it's what we were seeing in the example we just did. It doesn't matter what parameterization or what curve we use to get from point A to point B. If we do the line integral along any of those paths, we'll get the same result. That's what it means to be path independent. And path independence is a particular trait of a conservative vector field, uh, which will be the theorem just below. So suppose f is a vector field and f is continuous on region D. Uh, if that field is conservative, uh, then the line integral is path independent as long as we stay within our region. Uh, and then we can also say a slight converse there. So suppose f again is a continuous vector field on an open connected region in D, calling back to the definitions we looked at a moment ago. If that integral is path, that line integral is path independent within the region D, uh, then that will imply that F is a conservative vector field within that region, which means that there is some scalar function F, uh, so scalar function meaning that it's not a vector function, where the gradient of that little F is equal to our conservative vector field. So uh, those two bullet points really just said it doesn't matter which direction I approach this from, either starting from path independent and then saying that, oh, that means it must be a conservative vector field, or starting that we have a conservative vector field and then saying, oh, okay, we definitely have path independence. Uh, one is enough to prove the other. So let's do that example one more time. So evaluate the line integral of f dot dr from the point 0, 0 to the point 1, 1 in the vector field f that's equal to 2x, 2y, where c is the curve parameterized by the following picture. Over here to the right, where we're taking some really crazy path to get from 0, 0 to 1, 1. And if you think that we're actually going to parameterize that line, then you probably haven't been paying attention. So what we might want to notice is that our vector field f is the gradient of some other function. Uh, in fact, if we took the gradient of x squared plus y squared, it would come out to 2x, 2y. Meaning that our function f or our field F, that field, capital bold F, is in fact a conservative vector field because I know that there's a function that it came from. Uh, so that means that the line integral from 0, 0 to 1, 1 is path independent. So it does not matter what crazy curve I want to take. Uh, the integral of f dot dr is always going to come out to 2, as we saw in the example before. So I could take this crazy path if I wanted to. I could go through all the work of finding a good parameterization for it. I mean, good parameterization's probably not a great term anyway, because that parameterization is going to be just awful. Uh, but if I did and I applied the, the previous equation and did all that integration, which again would be a pain, it would come out to two. Because again, we have a conservative vector field, so it's path independent. Huzzah. All right, so if we have this particularly nice property of a conservative vector field, then it, we should develop some sort of a system that will let us look at a vector field and decide whether or not it's conservative. So another theorem with two points again, which will just be 
going from either direction, just like we looked at in the previous theorem. Let's take a look at what it says. Assume we have some vector field uh, that's equal to, you know, it's a, this is a 2D vector field. We're gonna have P be the X component and Q be the Y component. Uh, and so again, we said it's a conservative vector field and P and Q, which are functions of X and Y, have continuous partial derivatives uh, on some domain D. Then the derivative of P with respect to Y is equal to the partial of Q with respect to X. And conversely, uh, we'll assume that this time F is just a vector field on an open simply connected region D. And if P and Q have continuous partial derivatives and the same statement we said earlier, partial P with respect to Y is equal to partial Q with respect to X, then that's enough to say that that field we started looking at is conservative. So we can start from either direction. So let's talk for a moment about what this P and Q, what they are and what it means. Uh, and let's start from the direction of F being already a conservative vector field, which means that it is the gradient of some other function. If we take the gradient, we have the x partial is in the x coordinate and the y partial is in the y coordinate. So if I take the partial of p with respect to y, that really means I started from some original function, took a derivative with respect to x first, and then a partial derivative with respect to y second. Do the same thing for q. Uh, starting from the original function, it means I started with a derivative with respect to y and then took a partial derivative with respect to x. So the equation that we have right here in the middle, the left side is saying that this is some initial function, first with a partial with respect to x, then a partial with respect to y, whereas the right side saying I'm going to start with my initial function f, First, take a partial with respect to y, and then take a partial with respect to x. So ultimately, that thing in the middle is saying that as long as it's a conservative vector field, I have two ways of getting partial derivatives, taking a partial first with x and then with y, or first with y and then with x. And it should be equal no matter which way I do it. And that's really what we're looking at with this equation in the middle and ultimately how we're going to check to see if a field is conservative. Uh, because if we have a conservative vector field, that means we'll first have started with a function and we did partial derivatives with respect to x and y. Now we just need to do the other partial derivative for each one, check and see if they match up because if they do match up, then that means it came from a conservative vector field. And if they don't match up, that means that we did the, the x and y pieces did not originate from the same function. So it won't be a conservative field. All right, cool. Enough on that. Let's take a look at an example. So we're gonna consider the field shown here. Uh, we wanna show that it's conservative uh, and then find a potential function. So let's give that a shot. Uh, we'll start by taking the partial of the X component with respect to Y. So P partial Y should come out to negative E to the X sine of Y plus one. Since the derivative of cosine would be negative sine. Then We'll take the y piece, which is q, take its partial with respect to x, since if this is conservative, it's already had its partial with respect to y. So now I need to do its partial with respect to x and see what happens. Uh, the derivative of x is one. The derivative of e to the x sine y is gonna be e to the x sine y. Since the derivative of e to the x is itself. And we should hopefully notice uh, that in both of these cases, uh, we get the same thing on both sides. 
those two pieces are the same, which means that P partial Y is equal to Q partial X. Excellent. So now that we have shown that this is indeed a conservative vector field, we'd like to be able to find a potential function. And the thing we know about a potential function is that it must be the gradient of whatever that function is. So we're just going to do our best to undo the process of taking the gradient, which means we will integrate the x piece with respect to x, since that's the action that it had done to it. So we'll take e to the x cosine of y plus y and integrate this thing back with respect to x. Since I would have taken a partial with respect to x to get this piece, so I wanna undo that process. Doing so gives e to the x cosine y plus xy, plus here's where we would normally write c if we were doing you know, a regular calc one integral, some generic function for C, or we don't know exactly what it is, because if there were a constant, the derivative would have lost all information about it. This time though, since this is coming from a function of two variables, if there were any constant term or any term that depended only on Y, I would have lost it when I did the derivative. There would be no information about any term that depends only on y, which means that instead of saying plus c, we're going to say that this is plus some function that depends only on y. Since if there were any terms that depended only on y, again, we, we would have lost all information about it. So that was the x component. Let's do the same thing for the y component. Uh, so we'll take the integral of x minus e to the x sine y plus 3. And we'll integrate this one with respect to y, since that's the partial derivative that would have already been done to it to come from our potential function f. Doing so gets us xy minus e to the x times the integral of sine y, which would be negative cosine. So plus e to the x cosine y plus 3y. And again, if this were calc 1, we would have put plus c here. Uh, but this time, uh, just like when we looked at in the previous example, where we, if there were any terms that depended only on y, we wouldn't know anything about them in the x partial. This time, if there were any terms that depended only on x, we would have lost them. Uh, so instead of plus c, we'll say plus g of x. If there are any terms that depend only on x, the y partial wouldn't have any information about them. So let's scan through these two expressions that we just found and see where they overlap and where they don't. Both of these two terms have an xy plus e to the x cosine y, which means that it's definitely going to be part of our potential function because it shows up in both pieces. Uh, so I don't want to list these terms too many times. Uh, so we're, when we do write down our potential function, I'll want each of those terms only once. Then if I look into the part where I integrated with respect to y, I can find the value of h of y. h of y must be just 3y. Um, since there, that means that our potential function did in fact have a term that depended only on y. And then I could look through the integral with respect to x to see if there were any terms that depended only upon x, but there are not any. So g of x would be just zero or maybe just some constant term. So if we put those pieces together, 
means that our potential function, which is f of x and y, should be the common terms x, y plus e to the x cosine y plus any terms that depend only on x plus any terms that depend only on y. And now finally here at the end, this is where we'll come back to calc one and say plus c. Uh, since if there were a constant term, neither the y partial nor the x partial would have retained any information about it. So when we're looking for that potential function, we'll want to integrate both pieces of our vector field or all three pieces of our vector field if we look at three space uh, and then compare each of our terms. Uh, common terms that show up in all of our pieces will only list once. Uh, but then any unique terms that show up only in a y partial or only in an x partial, we'll need to list those as well. Uh, and if we wanted to check, we could take the gradient of this function f and see that we get back to our original vector field, capital F. So cool, that's our potential function, or at least a potential function, uh, since you know, we could have any constant term in there we would need some initial condition in order to be able to solve for C, just like we would have back in Calc 1. So let's say a bit more uh, about, these, about these line integrals that we're doing. Uh, this will be our fundamental theorem for line integrals. So assume that C is a smooth curve joining the points A and B. F will be some differentiable function with a continuous gradient vector, which is capital F. And that's again, a vector field. Uh, and this is all on that domain D containing C. Then we can say that the line integral of our conservative vector field is equal to F, our potential function, F of B minus our potential function F of A. And this is the part that should look just like the fundamental theorem of calculus from all the way back in Calc 1. Uh, and then one last theorem that we wanna say uh, we can say that the line integral of f is independent of path in our region D if and only if uh, the line integral of f is equal to zero for every closed path in D. So if we take any closed path, that means that we start and end at the same point. Uh, so that must come out to zero if we're in a conservative vector field. Uh, because we'd be coming back to that same point, f of b minus f of a should just be f of a minus f of a, which will come out to zero. So path independence in D uh, also means that the line integral is zero for every closed path in D. All right, let's do one final example. We'll take the line integral of f dot dr, where c is the curve parameterized by that function r, uh, where the vector field is the same field we saw earlier. Uh, and just like the last example we did, uh, we aren't going to bother with a parameterization at all. Uh, so it's nice that they gave us a parameterization. We could plug it in and calculate it out the way that we've been doing things, but let's not do that. And instead we can say that the line integral over our curve C of f dot dr should be equal to f of b minus f of a. And f of b should be the point one sine of one. And f of a should be the point zero sine of zero, which we'll just simplify to be zero. So if we plug all that stuff in, uh, remember, from the previous example, f of xy is xy plus e to the x cosine y 
plus 3y plus c, but we don't particularly need to worry about that part, not for a definite integral anyway. So let's plug some stuff in and see what we get. This should come out to sine of 1 plus e to the 1 times the cosine of sine of 1 plus 3 sine of 1 minus whatever we get when we plug in 0 everywhere. Uh, in that first term, it'll just be 0. e to the 0 cosine 0 is 1 times 1, so minus 1 plus 3 times 0, which is 0. So this should be our solution. Sine of 1 plus e to the 1 times cosine of sine of 1 plus 3 sine of 1, all of that minus 1. Yeah. 